Okay, welcome to part two of this introduction to Boudicca, which will be considerably shorter than part one. Uh, but just to pick up where we left off, the point I wanted to make to you and what I wanted to encourage you to do as you read through Tacitus' account of this rebellion is to pay attention how Boudicca is described as treating the people uh, that she's attacking. And remember that all of these different locations, Camulodunum, uh, Londinium, Verulamium, and then uh, Manduesidum, which is the f place of the final battle, these were all Roman settlements. And the Romans had been there for quite some time before Boudicca's uh, rebellion. So you're going to be kind of assessing her as a, a true warrior. She is leading her people and she is involved in the battle herself. The final battle between um, Boudicca's and, Boudicca and her people, so the Achaeni and also some of the other tribes who joined with her, and the Romans. Um, so at this point, this was the largest force of Romans on the island, uh, led by Paulinus, who was coming back from this other insurrection they were putting down on the western coast of the island happens at a place called uh, Manduesidum, but it has now become known as the Battle of Watling Street. And Watling Street is, unsurprisingly, the name of the street that runs through the location of the ancient battle. All right, so we're going to move forward. And in, in this <laughs> PowerPoint, uh, we have a video here that really outlines the various movements of all of the troops and summarizes the ways that the historians characterize these battles in terms of the uh, lives lost, the numbers, the tactics, the statistics. So I would recommend that you watch this before we come to class on Thursday. I think it will also help give you some context and give you some better grounding for when you do read Tacitus's account. It's not required, but it's a, a recommended watch. Um, it's about 11 minutes. You can probably skip through some of it, uh, but it does give you a much better sense of how these various battles were fought. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the historian that we're first going to be reading. So there's actually two historians who preserve at length information about Boudicca's rebellion. And the first is Cornelius Tacitus. Uh, he's also the earliest. So some background information on Tacitus. Tacitus was born in 55 CE, uh, and his family was probably a uh, Northern Italian or a Gallic. So Gallic in this sense today usually means French. So people from that area of um, Western Europe. That means that Tacitus himself was not born a Roman, right? But he, he is of European stock and his family eventually comes to Rome and he becomes a Roman citizen. Now you'll also notice the date that he was born 55 CE. And remember the date of the rebellion is 61 CE. So uh, Tacitus was six when this happens. And so think about how his proximity to the events might affect his ability to write a history of the events. Tacitus lived through the reigns um, of the emperors Nero up through uh, the emperor Trajan, 54 to 117 CE, and he was very much involved uh, in the political machine of Rome. He had a very long political career, and he later went on to govern a province, much like Suetonius Paulinus, who was put in charge of of Britain. Uh, Sueto or Tacitus was also rewarded uh, for his long service to the empire uh, with his own uh, high political ranking. The Annales, which is the work that we are going to be reading, is probably Tacitus's best known work, but he has five other works uh, that we know of and that we can access. One is the Dialogue on Orders, which is just a discussion of various uh, speech-making methods. The Agricola. Agricola in Latin actually means farmer, but in this case, Agricola was the uh, name of his father-in-law. Uh, and his father-in-law was another really important politician, so he writes a biography of, of his exploits. Uh, another work is called the Germania, or the Germania, which is an ethnographic study of the Germans. And you'll remember what ethnographic means from our discussion of the Amazons and some of the writers who wrote about them. 
Uh, he has another work called The Histories, which is essentially a history from the death of Nero up through the death of Domitian, one of the other later emperors. So this is getting into Tacitus's early life and memory. So uh, Nero dies in 68. And at that time, uh, uh, Tacitus would have been 13. All right. So he's he's kind of talking about events that he might, himself might have remembered. And then the Annales is a little bit longer. So it's a year by year history. And that's what Annales means. Um, our our uh, English word annals comes from Annales. Um, so the, the recording of various years. So this is a year by year history of the death of Augustus up to the death of Nero, so about 14 to 68 CE. And Tacitus is one of our best sources for the history of the early empire. So what happens after August, you know, Octavian becomes Augustus and becomes the first emperor of Rome? What happens um, when he dies uh, without a natural born child and uh, his family has to kind of decide who is going to succeed him and what those uh, successions are going to look like. So it's very fascinating stuff. And that's where our discussion of Boudicca comes from, the Annales. So let's talk very briefly briefly about uh, Tacitus as a historian. So we know that uh, he was he was a good historian in our sense of the term in that he was a close reader of earlier literary histories written about Rome at the time that he was studying, which was not that much later than his own, or I should say not too much earlier than his own, um, his own lifetime. Uh, so there, there was a fair amount of information still at hand because he was writing about things that happened only a generation to, th to three generations before his own life. Because he was a, a politician and a bureaucrat, he had a lot of access to many of those bureaucratic documents and the senatorial records that were archived um, as part of the record keeping process of the Roman Empire. So he did have access to those sorts of insider documents that we might think of today as being critical for understanding uh, the rationale behind decision making. Because again, of when he was born, and um, because of the time that he was writing about, it's very possible that Tacitus relied on eyewitness accounts to fill out um, his narrative of what was going on. So in those sort of top three boxes, we can see the methods of history and historical work that we as modern audiences are most familiar and most comfortable with. But if we look at the bottom two boxes, I think we can also see some of those characteristics that we also don't like about some of our historians from the ancient world that give us pause when we think about whether or not to to consider them truly creditable historians. So the first is that uh, Tacitus was very fond of repeating rumors and various traditions about his subjects. So that's not to say that he didn't have a good methodology or that he only relied on rumor, but he wasn't adverse to uh, printing or essentially publishing something that was unsubstantiated. Right? So there's a wrinkle that you can throw into reading his work. The other thing is that um, Tacitus likes to create characters. So we've talked about this a little bit when we talked about Herodotus, that Herodotus likes to imagine um, the people he's writing about as, as characters in the story. Like we can think about Cyrus and Tomiris, um, or we can think about Artemisia and Xerxes as having um, personalities of sorts, of having flaws. They speak, they have motivations, they have some interiority. And Tacitus does the same thing. Um, Tacitus also likes villains. You know, he likes to to heighten their crimes and heighten their uh, sort of mustache twirly um, aspects. And that can, um, in some cases, obscure uh, a more, what's the word I'm thinking of, a more unbiased perspective or more unbiased interpretation of the sources because he's looking for um, behaviors that would fit into a kind of recognized villain role or a villain slot. So some of these uh, quote unquote characters come off maybe a little bit more badly than other historians would have interpreted them to be um, because of 
Tacitus's desire to sort of preserve some of these rumors and because of his desire to sort of foreground um, the story element and to create a really uh, interesting antagonist in some of these stories. All right, so that's really where we're going to leave off for now. So please enjoy reading uh, Tacitus's Annales. Make sure that you look through the reading guide for some uh, help with the names and some of these terms that you wouldn't have encountered before. And uh, refer to the video for, again, more of the tactical information on these battles. It's a good outline of the events as they unfold, which can seem a little bit muddy in the narrative themselves. And then if you have any questions, don't forget to ask me. All right, I will see you all on Thursday.